Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from Pulse Academia and Industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. Hello, Professor Johnson. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Such an honor to have you. Excellent. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to ask you first uh, how you would like to define yourself or the audience and maybe first time listening to you. Uh, how do I like to define myself? Well, I, I'm a roboticist, okay? I've been thinking about robots uh, almost my whole life. Um, and I've always thought about them uh, uh, from, from kind of the physical interaction and mechanical point of view. I think about things in terms of dynamics and how to build them. And then of course, um, the control and the software and all of those things are, are the means to the end in order to make it happen. But I think about things in, in terms of the way they move. Uh, my whole career, I've been focused on understanding legged locomotion and understanding it from a first principles point of view, understand it from biomechanics, um, from basic simulation, uh, try implementing and doing robot experiments and continuing to learn from there to make robots that can go everywhere people can go and can start to manipulate and interact with the world the way, the way people do. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your childhood. We asked you guess about their childhood. How was your childhood? Was, do you have any memories about being interested in what you do now? Do you have any memories about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted to be like a mechanical engineer from a very young age. And, you know, as with a lot of people, I, I don't know, I, I built model airplanes, I played with Legos, you know, built a lot of things in the garage, um, soldered stuff together um, from a young age. I remember making little walking devices out of Legos really, really early on. And then, uh, you know, even up in going into college and stuff, doing the, the walking machine decathlon, which was a college competition during, uh, I was in the robotics club at the time. And then up through graduate school, working on uh, legged robots and uh, built Mabel and Thumper, which was, uh, Mabel was at the University of Mich Michigan uh, with Professor Jesse Grizzle there. And then on to being a professor and building the Atreus robot and, and you know building up a robotics program at, at Oregon State University and then spinning out a company, uh, Agility Robotics, mm -hmm. to continue the plan. You know, make, make robots useful and effective in the world, but um, now we're at the point where we understand enough of the science that the, we need to have really capable engineering and a really strong business plan in order to really make it effective. Mm -hmm. I really like this point. You, you made this point about how we have kind of useful and also beneficial robots as well. So how do you see that point, respectfully, when you speak about in academia in general, um, sure. what, with, with the way we design stuff? It's interesting because there's a real style and a culture difference between academia and, and industry or being an entrepreneur and starting a company. So in academia, a lot of times it's okay to explore. It's a good thing to explore. Even if you don't know exactly what something is gonna be useful for, if it's a new area that just hasn't been explored before and you can kind of come up with potential for it. You say, you know, if we figure this out, I think it'll be really useful for this range of things. That's, that's good enough and that's, really pretty important because a lot of times you discover things that you didn't expect to discover. Mm -hmm. um, but as an entrepreneur, it, it really absolutely must be focused on here is a customer and this is the problem that the customer has and here's how we're going to solve this customer problem in the very near future, in the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's, there's quite, a, quite a shift there from here's a really cool and interesting technical problem that I think will have applications that are really interesting to yeah. Here's a problem that we absolutely must solve. And then if you have a technical solution, like say, we understand legged locomotion now on a fundamental basis, we have to do a lot of engineering, but we understand it, that's going to enable robots to go where people go in the world. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Okay, now as a business use case, what application exactly will you know, human capable mobility and, and manipulation be, be useful for? How are you going to sell robots in the next year or two years and make money doing that so that you can continue that flywheel so you can support the engineers who are working there and so that you can continue to build it. Mm -hmm. um, both Very, interesting. Really valuable. Very interesting. But I guess in that case, the way we think, you know, perspective about the problem itself, how it it's like a problem, because it's a challenging task about the question, as you mentioned. What's something you see in common when you try to work in exploring new ideas or problems and also make sure it it has a profit in this in this day for what are you doing in the other side of uh, what you do. I don't know what's coming here. 
Well, it takes a team, right? And it takes the whole range of approaches to, to solve particular problems. And so it, it's really interesting to now have sort of been across that range. You know, I, what you wouldn't want to do in academia is just you have a technical, a thing of technical interest. You're not really sure what it's useful for, but it's technically interesting. A lot of times that ends up down a rabbit hole, you know, and, and maybe isn't the most productive use of time. On the other hand, in entrepreneurship, if you have, I, you, you know, I'm going to make yet another app and I'm going to put it out there and see if anybody buys it. And, you know, that also is it's the same kind of thing. It's exploration, but for different um, mm. I don't know, different type of problem solving. I'm either solving a problem in the market, some, something that somebody wants, or I'm solving a technical problem um, that, that hasn't been explored before. Very similar sol problem solving kind of approach though. Yeah. So coming back to look at the commotion, I'm curious what kind of things maybe when you try to do the inspiration from what we have already in evolution, I don't know what something maybe you think still need to be implemented or maybe you don't understand how this could be designed. Do you have any thoughts in your mind what how we can advance a little bit of the latest design for example digit for example where you have agility robotics so i don't know what what other thoughts you have so in turn for legged locomotion in general i mean it's going to be an entire industry there's going to be millions and millions of robots in the world that are going to be operating around humans and in human environments and, and helping us and working with us and and i think that's just an inevitable future and, and really part of uh, a future that's better for everybody um and there's gonna be a hundred years of innovation, just like, you know, pick the automotive industry. When was the auto cycle invented and, you know, four cylinder engines and so on. And they're still innovating um, on vehicles and cars. And the same is gonna be true of robots, of course. So we're in the very early days where I think we're just getting to the point where almost in the next few years, um, robots are gonna be, robots with, with legs in particular that can go where people go are gonna be possible and start to be useful. And that's just the beginning and it's gonna accelerate from there. Uh, so the basic concepts, I think we understand well, like uh, you know, our, our Atreus robot was able to walk and run and show the continuum of uh, speeds from uh, transitioning from walking to running. It was the first biped to reproduce human walking gait dynamics. So when the robot walks over a force plate and then a person walks over the force plate, you get the same measurements, uh, the same force, ground reaction forces, the same center of mass motion. Um, but that was, that was just a science demonstrator, you know, Atreus couldn't actually stand, it could only walk and run, uh, you know, it was very unwieldy, it broke all the time, it couldn't steer, um, but it captured kind of close enough to the core dynamics and the core physics of what is like a locomotion. Now, working up towards Digit, now it's becoming a 24 degree of freedom robot that, you know, still captures some of those core dynamics, but is also able to stop and stand and turn sideways and pick up a box and reach up high to the top of the shelf to um, pull a box down from up there and stack totes and, you know, open a door and, and things like that, which is not the same as just the dynamical behavior of legged locomotion. So it, the complexity continues to go up and up. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the refinement needs to keep getting better. So, you know, Atreus didn't have any perception, right? So there was really no way for Atreus to say, go up or down stairs. It could handle a big obstacle. But now, of course, we need to integrate planning into that dynamical behavior, uh, which, is, which is not trivial because, you know, if you're planning and you want your feet to be in certain places, well, that contradicts where your balance and dynamics say your feet need to be. Need to be. So integrating that so that you you're really planning through the dynamics of your system is kind of a new direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a lot of little things like a um, robot's a little bit loud right now when it's walking around. And that's just because there's a lot of inertia in the lower feet. And so when they hit the ground, it's a bit of a loud impact. You can hear it because there's also hollow tubes and shells, you know, in the leg that, uh, but that's a, that's a problem in terms of perception and, how, and durability for the robot. Mm -hmm. So one of our recent directions has been, you know, solving that problem and it, it was a lot more nuanced and interesting than i thought and we have some specific you know patents uh pending on how to do that and how to walk around in a way that you can still capture all the dynamics that you want but it's no louder than a person walking around um, and using an electric motor that has a lot of inertia to it so how do you handle it how do you handle that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a good point so when it comes to design i don't know do you believe that maybe in future iteration why do you select this kind of this design particularly? Because we speak about the design and the fitnesses of the robot at different environment. Yeah. Do you believe that 
you can push the limit beyond the design that we already traditionally take an expression from the evolution, for example. I don't know, do you believe commercially speaking here because you're interested in that going beyond the, the design or inspiration from the nature, do you believe is, is worthy to consider? Well, I will say that the design of digits like it evolved from the design of Cassie and Atreus and Thumper and Maple and you know earlier robots before that. And all of these are perhaps inspired by biology, by biology, but more inspired by the physics of biology, and then inspired mm -hmm. by first principles of order features of the dynamics that we require. So you know, start with you look at biology and you see, oh, all animals, horses, ghost crabs, mm -hmm. humans. Um, when they're doing cyclic leg and locomotion, it, it looks like a simple spring mass model. You know, this is a, just a human generated made up model that kind of looks like how the animals behave and describes some of that behavior. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a perfect representation. It's certainly a reduced order model. Um, you know, you've probably heard the saying that all models are wrong and some are useful. Um, this is kind of like that. It's a really useful model and, and better than any of the other very, very simple ones in terms of conceptually representing what's going on. So we built our first robots kind of just based on that. What, how can we represent these physics that are, that are shown through this simple math model? Um, and then we discovered things like antagonistic work in the Atreus leg where one motor is always doing negative work on the other. And so the motor that's doing positive work has to both overcome the negative work of the other motor and do all the work on the world in order to locomote. So that you know, led to an evolution on the Cassie leg that eliminates this antagonistic work but still tries to keep the, the physics that we want. Now I talked a little bit about how we design feet so that we're dealing with the inertial impact on the ground. All of those are the things that cause us to evolve our leg configuration and the design. Um, we are not trying to ever copy an animal in terms of its morphology or how it looks. We are only trying to copy the performance or the capabilities uh, that, that a human may demonstrate or that an animal may demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Great. So when it comes to resilience or redundancy and designing, do you consider this kind of design? I don't know how do you see the resilience when it comes to legged locomotion in that case? Well, you know, I, an example I like is uh, the original Segway um, when, you know, when it was new, they, they had on the windings of the motors, it was actually two windings on the same motor frame and they had two completely separate sets of power electronics. So if any of those things failed while you're on the Segway balancing, um, it won't go as fast, but it'll still balance and it won't just dump you off the thing and, and cause an injury. And I think that's the kind of thing we're likely gonna need to do in the future and moving forward with this, uh, with this robot. Um, safety is gonna be critical and important. You know, these robots are intended to be able to work around people. Uh, so it's going to be a statistical thing because there's no way to mathematically prove whether it's safe or not. And it's many, many degrees of freedom. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So redundancy is going to be really important. Uh, already we have, you know, dual encoders on every joint. We have a lot of checks throughout the system so that if things start to go a little bit wrong, you get warnings far before something really catastrophically goes wrong. Uh, and then you have to think very carefully about how does the robot shut down. You don't want to just turn it off, for example, cut power, because the thing collapses in a heap and it can, it's heavy, it's 110 pounds. So, you know, conceivably it could land on your foot and, and injure you. Um, or more likely is damage the robot when it falls. So really you want it to kind of stop and then sit down on the ground and then turn off or go into sort of a damping mode where it sort of falls in a very graceful way. Uh, I think most of the, the Redundancy, though, it, it's going to be proactive, you know, like a helicopter. There's only so much you can do with a helicopter to make sure that it won't fail. Really, you just I mean, maintain it regularly, make sure it won't. Mm -hmm. Great. But when you look to that, maybe from the research point and also in what we do at, at, from a job growth as well, do you, do you believe there's missing pieces in general that we need to consider when it comes to legged robots, for example, designing? I don't know if you believe there's missing pieces that we have to give more attention or focus. Uh, I think the community is actually doing an awfully good job of finding all the interesting directions and the interesting things that need to be focused on. Like I said, there's a hundred years and more and just more of, of innovation on this. There's, um, you know, how do you control these things is, is really obviously a challenge and kind of, kind of new. Um, 
how do you control a 24 degree of freedom mobile robot that is constantly interacting with a somewhat uncertain environment in a dynamical way? Um, what a new and interesting problem, right? And a lot of classical control approaches, which I don't know, make various, you have to write the equation out in closed form, you know, linearization, all it's not gonna work. It's optimizations, it's stochasticity, it's reinforcement learning, but they're not, none of them can be a black box. You don't want to learn everything from scratch and just sort of rely on a computer to learn something. It's, it's an engineered system that is every bit as complex or more so than the physical hardware of the robot. And there's an awful lot that we know about legged locomotion because of the experience with the robots and because of you know, working with, the, with, with bio, biological systems and studying animals. That structure needs to go in as the engineers design and build these, these control systems. Um, I would say that's one of the really big focuses. The hardware is um, on a path of continuous improvement where it's just about to the point where it's above the bar, where it's good enough, where we know how to make a piece of hardware that can walk and run and have arms and perception and so on. And it's, it's engineering for the uh, application and doing excellent engineering to make it good. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. But I'm curious about, since you mentioned, for example, at open ended environment, or as you mentioned also, how we can design the robots that could be continual learning as well and have this kind of generic behavior and adapting as well. Can you tell us more about what could be still limitation or maybe can be achievement here in this area when it comes for this problem? So there's sort of two pieces to it. You know, one is how do you design a behavior? How do you get a robot that's able to uh, walk up and down stairs, go through a doorway, pick up a box, et cetera. And then the other one is how do you, um, I don't know, how do you teach it new behaviors over time or how does the robot learn a new task? In my opinion, um, you know, there's always going to be engineering. There's no reason to not have intention and engineering behind generating and learning these behaviors. Uh, and remember that they're robots. So you just over the air update and all of the robots now have the particular skill that you want them. So think of it more like um, a smartphone and the apps for your smartphone. You have a piece of hardware that is generally quite capable. You put on the software applications for the different tasks and the different roles, the different jobs that you want it to do. Learning in order to generate the behaviors in the first place is engineered. It's something that you learn in simulation. It's something that engineers set up the problem, set up the, the task, um, refine and improve a particular behavior. And then they're able to push that out to all the different robots. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to best of dynamics as well, and I don't know how you can uh, couple that with controlling the behavior and with the best of dynamic in that case. Okay, so the, the difference between passive dynamics and controlling behavior. The way I see it is what we're trying to do is engineer a behavior. And then whether we do that in software or in hardware, you know, in passive dynamics or in control is straight up an engineering question. And it depends on the application. It depends on the task. It depends on the size of the robot. It depends on lots of things. Mm -hmm. Really the only real reason to incorporate significant passive dynamics is if you can't do it in software because of your limitations of actuator dynamics. So for example, um, a very small quadruped robot, um, you can do, direct drive or close to direct drive uh, and get very low inertia out of your electric actuators and all of your behavior can pretty much be generated in software. Uh, but as it scales up, the volume of the robot increases by the cube of the size and the force or the torque that you can apply on your motors is just a surface area between the magnets and the windings and that only goes up by the square. And so you're really forced to have gearboxes and other things on larger robots that really increase the inertia, uh, the reflected inertia or the effective inertia on the output of your actuators. Um, and that really gets in the way of dynamics. And so at that, that point now you're forced to add some passive dynamics, either physical springs or like a staged contact with the ground or as has been done for, with humanoid robots for 20 or 30 years, place the foot very, very gently on the ground. It's very different from how a human does it, right? Where you just are walking along and even when you're running or watch an ostrich going, those feet came to come down really fast. They have very low inertia at the end effector and they have very large compliance in order to be able to, to do that. So yeah, passive dynamics is really critical, um, but that doesn't mean we wanna build entirely passive dynamic walkers. 
mm -hmm. because we also want the versatility and the, and the freedom to do lots of things. And if you put too much in the passive dynamics, you can only do the one thing that the passive dynamics want you to do. So as with many things, it comes down to uh, just saying, well, it's complicated and it depends on what you're trying to do. And understanding it well allows you to make good choices, good engineering choices. That's what, yeah. And I'm curious in that case, if there is any trade off, do you think, and I've the trade off when you're trying to design uh, what you're trying to do, if there's any avoidable trade off, you can't really avoid them if you have encountered any sort of design process. Well, I mean, there are many, it's, it's, there, there's so many pressures. Like we have a 24 degree of freedom robot, okay? The heavier you make the robot, the harder it is to get it to lift itself. How do you make something that's light enough, um, but also strong enough so that when it falls, you know, it's not going to just break every single time or every time it takes a step, you know, having things part or break. It has to be reliable, even though it's in the presence of consistent impacts. So it's always a balance of trying to put motors on it that are big enough that we get enough strength and torque and speed, but small enough that we don't spiral out of control on our weight. Um, I don't know, choosing motors that are, you know, a trade-off between the torque that we want and minimizing and, and, and the mass that we want, but also minimizing the inertia of, of that rotor for the impacts. Uh, you know, form factor. You, you, don't, you don't want to put giant bulky motors on everything and then, you know, the robot just doesn't have the dexterity or the reach to get in where you want it to go. Um, I don't know, hu human interaction is going to be absolutely critical for these machines because they're operating in human spaces. And if people are worried about the robots or if the robots are doing things that are unpredictable, people just won't like them. And it doesn't really matter if they're a little bit useful, people won't want them or like them around. And that's a very real barrier that absolutely must be overcome, I think with equal importance to the actual engineering of making it physically do a job. You have to have people appreciate the robot as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's trade offs across the board. Yeah, and I'm curious about also sometimes when we design something, since you mentioned about the modeling from the physics of that, how the animals behave, for example, in that case, if there's any counterintuitive, um, maybe design when you try to try that sign, it was counterintuitive how it behaved, maybe contrary to what you actually imagined in the model or simulation. I don't have any moment like that, what counterintuitive? Yeah, I, I could give one example of that. So. Uh, back when we were working on the Atreus robot and we were trying to model the spring mass behavior of, um, that we saw from animal locomotion, we tried very hard. We had big physical springs on it, fiberglass springs that um, are very efficient, you know, uh, just about as efficient as, as, as a spring can reasonably be. Uh, what we found though is that allowing half of the compliance, like making the stiffness, the physical stiffness twice as stiff as you want it, and having the other half of your leg compliance be proportional control in the motors, so that the motors are back driving through a terribly inefficient harmonic drive, so that basically every time we hop up and down, we're losing 50% of our energy. Um, having that inherent dissipation just built into the system really stabilized everything and settled it down, because it's an underactuated system. So energy is coming in in all different directions and coming into a spring, which means it's got to come out at some point in some other direction. And it is very hard to steal that, or steer that energy cycle and make sure that energy goes where you want it to go. On the other hand, if you're always dissipating 50% of all of your energy, and then your motors are only pumping energy in in the direction that you want it for the particular oscillation, quickly, you can just shrug off disturbances. Whatever energy comes into the system in whatever direction, you don't have to explicitly sense and control it it just kind of dissipates away and you pump the oscillation that you want with your controller. And that was really interesting. That was kind of a, a learning experience for us. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I guess about the iteration for design, what could be maybe the lessons do you learn it from each iteration? Or maybe just make understanding more clear to you. What, what the thing that you notice in each design, each iteration you do so many years now? Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just, come up with an example of um, another iteration piece, right? So how have our feet evolved over time? At the very beginning, we had just point feet on the ground because in order to walk and run, feet are completely unnecessary. We made a spring mass model. But, you know, our robot is 3D, the spring mass model is not, it's planar. So what would happen is the robot Atreus would rotate sideways. And so its orientation 
uh, the direction that was pointed would be mismatched from velocity or the direction it was going. And it would end up sidestepping and falling over. And that was the main mode of failure. So we you know, just added some really simple little floppy feet on the bottom of it that would just not allow the robot to twist freely when it was standing. Um, but even with that, now it doesn't twist so much. It was able to walk and run, but you can't stand, right? Because if you're standing on two feet and the robot just starts leaning forward, you have to keep taking steps in order to place. So we added a one degree of freedom foot on Cassie that allows the robot to stand. And more or less, they look, they're like ice skates. They're very narrow and long. Uh, they allow you to apply torques to the ground to steer and they allow you to stand in place. You can't stand on one foot, um, but generally we don't need to do that. So we figured that was a good balance between minimizing the amount of inertia at the very end effector, um, but adding enough degrees of freedom there to do what we need. But interestingly, what, one of the problems is given that the only way you can balance really side to side, especially in this case, is by placing your feet, you need to always be placing your feet very quickly. And so that's why you get the robot kind of marching. It's always placing its feet quickly. Uh, and for something like going up and down stairs, where the location where you can place your feet is constrained, um, we found we could really only run upstairs. Like we could only go quickly. If you tried to go slowly, you're falling the whole time your foot is in the air and you have to take much larger excursions to place your foot really far away. And it was harder to balance if you walked really slowly. Um, and that kind of uh, spread from, you know, once we observed that on the stairs, we also noticed that, that was true in many, many places. And having two degrees of freedom at the foot so that throughout the whole stance, you have some small amount of control over your trajectory and where you're going uh, is actually really important. And that's not something that we could have appreciated until we you know, tried it first and kind of got there. So that's one example. And it's always, you know, we start with the absolute simplest system and get that really working well. And then when we see something like that, where it's clearly important and we don't have it, we want to add one feature at a time. Because if you start too complicated, it's, it's just about impossible to figure out all the implications of what's happening. Great. So I'll go to the audience question. We have a question here from Kevin. Let me ask you, if we look 10 or 20 or 50 years into the future of how will be robotic actuation change? Will we more away from electric motors? What breakthroughs do you think would be required to elevate robotics to a higher level of dy dynamics here? Okay, so the question is, you know, are we still going to be using electric motors in 10, 20, 30, 50 years? Uh, what would we really need to elevate uh, robotics to do more and be more capable. Uh, hard to say for 50 years, I don't see any technology on the horizon that I personally am aware of that feels like it's going to be a promising replacement for electromagnetic actuators. Um, and the flip side of that is I see an awful lot of room for improvement on electromagnetic actuators. And that's enabled by firmware and power electronics getting much, 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 much smaller. So, you know, on, on Atrius, we had this uh, giant brick, a power amplifier to power our motors, which was like three and a half pounds. And it was, it was just huge uh, to fit that on the robot. And now 24 degrees of freedom, we have these tiny little you know, pieces of power electronics to, to run these motors and to run a uh, high amperage, 80 amps, uh, 80 volts, something like that uh, through these motors. And we have on board each of these is a really sophisticated uh, microcontroller all run through a two kilohertz data, data bus on the EtherCAT line. That enables some pretty amazing things. And then if you can do your own commutation on a motor, and then you can start to incorporate all of your sensors locally and then start designing your electromagnetic actuators um, in a more specialized way for what you're trying to achieve, there's a huge amount of room for improvement there uh, on how electric magnetic actuators work. I don't also, think that muscles are, you know, people sometimes say, wow, if only we had a muscle and we could use muscles on robots. Mm. It's unclear to me that muscles are all that much better than electric motors. They have their own limitations and they have their own challenges and problems and the actuator dynamics that biological systems have to work around. And we have advantages with electric motors um, and disadvantages. So they are different, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure they're that much worse. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, Gord, yeah. And we have also a question from Alan. He asks us, um, 
Do you think making the designs open source will help the progress in this area? No, yeah. I don't think it's very helpful. Um, I think, so there's two pieces to it. Number one, the supply chain and the manufacturing and the assembly is super hard and it takes an organization, it takes a lot of people to do that. Um, mm. Even if it's a relatively simple design and straightforward for people to build, like um, MIT uh, Mini Cheetah, uh, Songbae Kim's group, uh, that thing is really impressive. I love it. Uh, it's a wonderful design and it's really effective. Uh, for most groups though, they would rather just buy one for a thousand or two thousand or I don't know how much money it costs, but a few thousand dollars. They would rather just buy one and have it than have to go find the machine shop and find the components and figure out how to assemble it, build it themselves. Uh, open source does mean that, you know, there are companies that will sell it to you for very low cost, but it also means that whoever designs it has to be volunteering to do it. So, you know, the latest, I don't know, Mustang Mach-E or, or Tesla model, you know, model three or that sort of thing is only enabled because you buy it, because you pay money for it that allows the, it's the flywheel. It supports the continued development of the engineers that are able to build that. And that's a really powerful driver of progress. Um, open source absolutely has its place uh, and it absolutely can be a driver for innovation and, and sharing. Um, but usually for things that, you know, individuals or small teams can build off of quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, so, I hope what is more useful is having a good source where you can uh, buy these things like Agility Robotics has been selling the Cassie robots and now the Digit robots to academic communities, as well as to uh, commercial customers uh, and having, a, you know, a generation of PhD students coming up that have that piece of effective and reliable hardware to then develop their own ideas on for controls, um, I, I believe is having an impact. We're really proud of that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But I'm curious in that case, do you, why do you think the cost of robotics in general is still expensive? How we can reduce the cost maybe in the long term? Do you- uh, volume, if... just volume. Like <laughs> once we're able to make a thousand robots, 10,000 robots for, you know, uh, spreading out into the logistics industry and, and moving packages and things like that, the cost the costs just start to plummet. There's a, a very, very, very high overhead in terms of doing the engineering and getting the supply chain in place to be able to achieve that. Um, and that's how you get the cost down. I mean, there's really no reason why, uh, you know, the digit robot, it, it's, not, it's not exotic in how it's being manufactured. It's mm -hmm. along the lines of an electric motorcycle in terms of, you know, maybe add another, add a laptop to it, you know, a little more computation and, you know, the batteries and the electronics and, and the manufacturing is very similar. So similar cost basis when you manufacture them in, in volume. Mm -hmm. And is there any maybe limitation or challenges you believe maybe as technology roadblocks in that case? I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I think it's gonna be a lot more like, um, I don't know, like Alexa or Siri where, People are super excited about it, but then maybe get a little bit frustrated at how much it can't quite do. And then don't pay attention to it for a few years while it consistently and methodically improves. And at some point people are just using the voice, you know, uh, commands and, and talking with their devices. And it's actually starting to become useful as people don't really notice it. And we're not quite there yet. We're just about to the point with the robots where it's gonna to start to be useful, but only for a few people and in specialized applications and situations. That's the hump to get over because then the flywheel has started and now we're starting to um, bring the costs down and improve the capability consistently over time. And then at some point you kind of realize, oh, I've been using these robots for a while. They're really, really useful. Uh, I, think, I think just that's the challenge is that, that continuous improvement and making sure we get into that better. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, since we close the SIFI question, the first one about simulation to reality, I think that's something also interesting for you. And I'm curious in general in the robotics field, where do you, the statement about that make the simulation really captures this dynamic and this all the maybe the complex environment before going and I don't know how do you see the development here, what is missing here, I believe. Yeah, it's interesting. I I, I the simulation is I don't see any fundamental roadblocks, right? Of course, getting the sophistication of the simulation up is, is important and adding features to it and, and having, but the automotive 
you know, op, uh, autonomous car industry has really pushed that really far. And there's so much that's developed in simulation um, and simulated sensing and perception of, of what the robot, or in this case, a car is seeing and then how it reacts to it. And that's the same thing for our robot as well. Now, a lot of people have talked about the, uh, the challenge of sim to real. Can you, you know, control it and make it work in the simulation? And then is that gonna to translate to the real world? In my experience, that has more to do with the robustness of the control system and the dynamics than it does with the realism of the simulation. So for example, if the rigid body bag dynamics aren't actually very accurate in the simulation, sometimes the, you know, the foot will come to the ground, will penetrate the ground, and then the simulation will realize it and then put it up above the ground and then it'll move around a little bit and jiggle there. So there's really uncertainty on when contact happens. And then for certain systems that can really mess with it and destabilize it. But in the real world, if you're walking and running and then you land on grass, which is actually really soggy after a rain and then gravel or mud and then pavement, it's exactly the same. And your whole dynamical system just has to be robust to that kind of disturbance and those kinds of errors. So what we found early on is when the system is robust to that, then we get a really excellent um, match between something working in simulation and then working in the real world. So I think it's more just, I, I think we have simulations that are good enough to do the physics right. And now it's really a matter of building in the feature sets um, so that you can model the world a bit in the digital twin and design out your, you know, your features of the job or whatever it is you want to be doing. Um, and then you get it into the, into the real world and then you continue to tweak mm -hmm. from there for little things that might not have been a, a perfect match. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any sort of crazy ideas when you try to think about the future for agile robotics. I don't know why I try to think about how the future generation looks like or the designs or features or functionalities. I don't know what kind of crazy thoughts you have, if you have. Well, I don't yeah, look, just in the very near future, what we're doing, we, we're, the, these digit V3s are what we're producing right now. Mm -hmm. So the first commercial product, the first commercial humanoid out there. Um, you know, V4 is on the horizon. Uh, we're working on it. It's going to be another year and a half or something like that. But we're incorporating features like manipulators to do basic stuff, open doors, pick up boxes and things like that. We're working on uh, the feet that are going to quiet down the, the gate and change a little bit about how the behavior sounds. Uh, we're adding self-charging so the robot can walk in and sit down on its own charging dock. Uh, we're adding a head to it that adds some sensing and perception up there as well as uh, a chance to do some decent human interaction to give people cues about mm -hmm. what the robot is about to do uh, and things like that. And then continuing to improve uh, the behaviors and uh, you know, grow out the, the company and the organization to, to do more and more. It's a mm -hmm. continuous improvement at this point. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, so you, you're joining and co-founding the Agile Robotic. I don't know if you have any moment of doubt and it's still, I don't know, because sometimes it's challenging. I don't know how do you see the competition or be the market itself because robotics is so challenging. As you yeah. mentioned, so. no, it, I it's quite hard, know. right? So there's there's a, there's a belief barrier. Like we're very we have, we've seen this. We're in, on the inside. We know that the future is very close in terms of having these robots operating in human spaces and human environments. But a lot of people's opinions have been shaped by movies or I don't know the last thirty years of, of um, legged locomotion and humanoid research, which has been progressing, and now it's at the point where it's going to just over the hump, but they don't necessarily know that. And so they say, well, really, is this gonna be ready in two years or is it gonna be another 50 years? We don't really know. So showing the robot doing the job, showing the robot doing the task and having people come and put their hands on the robot and feel it moving and seeing it, that really is, is we've got a lot of work to continue to do there. And Boston Dynamics has been doing that as well. And so that's, that's helpful to us, kind of changing people's understanding of what is going to be possible. And honestly, we see that you know, they, you're never supposed to read YouTube comments, right? <laughs> if you want to feel good about yourself, don't read them. But I will say that glancing at it every now and then, um, the general attitude has shifted over even the past five years, certainly over the past 10, um, about how this is gonna, how close we are and how this is coming. Yeah, right. So um, I don't know if you believe ego is important for you when you try to have new ideas or discussion, I don't know, do you believe Having ego is important for you? Having confidence is really important. 
Um, but it's also really important to hear people, to hear ideas from wherever they come, to um, have a real diversity of opinions, to uh, productively encourage um, people at an organization and people outside of your organization to challenge you and challenge what you think you're doing or what you think is right. Uh, so, you know, an, an ego can have negative connotations where you kind of ignore information that would be really useful to you or have too much personal investment into it. Um, where like you individually want to be the hero rather than, and, and that's not useful, but having enough of an ego where you know, where you know that you're confident in what you know, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a good understanding of when someone else tells you or criticizes and you know that you're right about something, it's important to be able to continue to go forward in that direction. Mm -hmm. Great. And if there's a student, if you're curious, we yeah, work in this domain. What could be the most important maybe uh, subject or area of focus of research do you believe that we have to consider so that we can be involved in the legacy robotics research? So I, you know, I talked with a lot of students about this. Le legged robots are just super exciting. You know, they certainly were to me and, and they are to a lot of students. Um, really, it's what is your talent? What is the thing that you know how to do well and that you pick up more quickly than others and that you're excited about? and you're interested in. Um, because doing something like legged locomotion or any robotics requires such a range of talents and it requires teams of people who are able to work together well. It's not one person who's a genius building something ever. It's big teams of people who are really, really capable and are able to rely on, on really capable colleagues and coworkers um, in, in order to produce something together. So if you are really, really good at coding or really interested in a particular direction of software, you know, do that. If you're really interested in sensors and, and actuators, do that. If you're really interested in, you know, building things and, you know, machining things, do that. All of those are going to have a role in, in, in building robotic systems. Mm -hmm. But also make sure you keep a little bit of breath. So, you know, when I teach uh, like the um, applied robotics course, and there's teams of three, and we always team up someone whose skill primarily, their talent is in mechanical design and building with someone whose uh, talent is in say, microcontrollers and power electronics, and someone who's got experience with kind of, you know, computer perception and vision and so on. And the three of them need to work together well. But the worst teams, the ones that don't perform very well, the ones where they separate out into their roles. And the mechanical mm -hmm. designer says, well, I don't know what the software person's doing, but I'm doing this piece of it. The best teams are the ones where, uh, for example, uh, agility robotics uh, software team is mostly people who come from a mechanical engineering background. Uh, they really understood the physics and the dynamics of things, but went in the software engineering direction and learned the tools that they needed to learn there. Uh, and are, are able to, even though they're doing software, they're writing controllers, they're not on the hardware team, they're able to communicate really, really well with the hardware team. And a bunch of people on a hardware team have backgrounds in, say, software engineering or electrical engineering, but then went the direction of you know, building things. So have some flexibility and have some breadth and make sure you can work with others. My background is in mechanical, really. I was a mechanical engineer as an undergraduate and I built things. But I got a PhD in robotics at, uh, at the Robotics Institute, which is in the School of Computer Science. And I was one of two mechanical engineers out of 100 graduate students who were mostly computer scientists. And that was incredibly valuable to me, um, mm. being able to work with and interact with people of other, um, other disciplines. Wonderful. So um, I don't know what could be the most important quality you believe that you have gained or have to maintain from this experience. What, what could be the most important quality? The most important quality, I think, is people who proactively go learn what they need to learn in order to be better at what they do and better at working in an organization. Mm -hmm. That's it right there. Um, there's a lot to learn, not just in the technical of what you're doing, but also in how do you grow a team? How do you work with teams? Uh, how do you have enough emotional intelligence and awareness to work with others well? Um, it's the only way to grow an organization. Mm -hmm. So it's the self-improvement and the, the proactive drive to improve yourself. That's the most important um, feature that I see. Mm -hmm. and are there any book inspired you? Uh, I don't know, through what, what you're doing. Any book have you have ever read and was inspiring and stick to your mind? I mean, quite a few. Uh, 
you know, I'm trying to think of uh, a lot of the, the people that I can think of that are coming to mind were fairly specific to me and my specific technical interests. So, you know, I was doing cable drives in graduate school and uh, Bill Townsend, um, who, who owns and runs uh, Barrett Technology and they built the Wham Arm, um, you know, one of two people in the world along with uh, his advisor, um, who, who kind of invented the cable differential into cable drives. Those people were really, it was really great to be able to meet them and interact with them uh, and learn from them. Uh, but that was very specific to me. So I think, you know, when you follow your interests, it's like, it's good to have like the individual heroes, the, the person that succeeded in the way that you individually want to succeed and then go find that person and, and talk with them. That's very smart, yeah. I don't know if you have any advice was given to you and was life changing, so you, what you do. If there's an advice, was a life changing for you, you have ever received? I'm sure there was, but let's see, off the top of my mind. I think that like one of them that kind of comes to mind here, it, it, it more generally applies to focus um, on what you want to achieve. So, you know, when I was a, a young professor, I was doing a lot of things and trying to do a lot of things. And a lot of things were very worthwhile. Um, and, you know, the question from my department head was, is that going to get you tenure? Is that going to get you tenure? And, you know, that's sort of a, maybe tenure is not the be all and end all. That's not really the critical piece, but the critical piece is what are you trying to achieve here? If you don't do what you need to do in order to do tenure, you're not going to be able to do all those other things that you want to be doing as well. Um, so make sure you take care of the, the, the most important piece. And I guess when running a company, the question there is, what is going to solve the customer's problem? What is the business task that you're solving? How are you going to make sure that your company is successful? That's the only way I'm going to be able to solve some of the really exciting engineering and, and science challenges that I want to and build the cool robots that I want to, is if the business is able to grow and be uh, successful. Um, so I, I think pieces of advice that have really picked on, lay out the things you want to do and make sure you stay focused on the thing that's going to enable you to be successful so that you can do all the things you want to do. That's Prioritize. Really Prioritize. Oh, that's really yeah. I don't know if you have any final words you'd like to say for the audience uh, for closing. I don't know if you have anything what would like to say. I don't know, I thought you asked some excellent questions. I really like the questions on, you know, Thank what's you. some advice and what are some priorities? And uh, um, yeah, I liked being able to talk about the importance of, of working with others and finding people that you respect to work with and then making sure that you are the kind of person that others will want to work with as well. And how important that is to, to the success of, of um, any organization. Thanks so much, Professor Jones. I think it was very inspiring and you're a brilliant researcher. So thanks a lot for being at the bottom. I deeply appreciate your time. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much.